talk to us about this violin uh, argument, this bodily autonomy argument. Yeah. Maybe f t tell us a bit of the background behind this argument. Perhaps state it as well as you can. Sure. And then yes, show us yes. how to respond. I, I, I love, as, as you're you know, making the point about doing, I love taking the pro-abortion argument at its strongest yes. and even then showing how weak it is, uh, yes. even if it's stronger compared to other ones. So, so I think we should, you know, <laughs> so steel manning is kind of the, the idea where, yeah. you, where you make someone's argument as strong as possible. This is, of course, what Aquinas does in the right. Summa. Uh, so I think we should use a new term like Aquinasing. Aquinasing. Aquinas that argument for me. Yes. Yeah, really okay. steel man it for me. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So moving beyond what we've just looked at, which is the idea that abortion supporters will say the embryo isn't a person, what is happening is some abortion supporters are saying, yeah, the embryo is a person. The embryo is equal to you or hmm. me. The embryo has the same right to life that you or I have, but wow, wow, they will wow, argue. Wow. Let's just stop there for a second yes. because you so often do not get that admission from pro-abortion folks, at least those who haven't thought about it a great deal. It, correct. Well, it's more on the university campuses, amongst right. the philosophers. They've kind of moved in this direction. Ah. And it's an argument that, I don't know if you could say was first proposed by Judith Jarvis Thompson, but was, you could say, made famous by an abortion supporter by the name of Judith Jarvis Thompson, who okay. in the 19, I believe it was 1970s, wrote a paper called Unplugging the Violinist or something along those lines. And, and um, she was making the point that someone can be considered equal to another, but not have the right to another's body. And so the analogy she came up with to demonstrate that point was to say, Imagine you wake up one morning mm -hmm. and you are not at home, you're mm -hmm. in a hospital. You yep. don't know how you got there. And you try to roll over in the bed you're in and you see there's another human in the bed with you and you're attached to them. She said, imagine now a doctor comes into the hospital room and says, I'm terribly sorry for the situation you find yourself in, but um, last night you were kidnapped. Uh, you were kidnapped by the Society for Music Lovers because you see this society uh, knew of a world famous violinist that they loved and this world famous violinist was gonna die and the Society for Music Lovers didn't want that to happen. They wanted to preserve his life. And they realized that there was only one person in the entire world who had the right body type who if connected to the violinist mm could keep the violinist alive. And so they discovered that person was you, mm -hmm. and they kidnapped you, and um, here you are, this is a world famous violinist, uh, he can entertain you while you're in bed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so she says, now imagine the doctor says to you, don't worry, you're not in this situation forever. It's just for nine months. Mm. And so- This woman's clearly a philosopher. <laughs> her point was to say, even though the violinist is a human person, has the same dignity, has the same, same, dignity same right to life, is equal to you. This living human person does not have a right to use your body without your consent. And so she argues just as you can reach around and unplug the violinist, so too ought a pregnant woman be allowed to unplug, so to speak, her fetus, who's a living human person, mm. because the living human person does not have the right to, to the woman's body. To use your body. Yeah. That's, you've put that very well. Thank that, that, you. That feels very... Well, I think I would have done Judith Jarvis Thompson proud. <laughs> yes, good, good, good. Okay, and so is this an argument you ever heard and were rattled by? Yes. Oh, yes. Tell us about that. Yes. Well, I, I remember being rattled. So I, when I first heard the argument, I believe it was in a philosophy class at UBC, and that argument was in my textbook. And there was, in fairness, not so fair, but in fairness, there was a pro-life essay in the textbook too, but it was not very good mm. at all. And I remember reading it being like, I need to submit a better essay for this textbook. Yeah. So that's when I first encountered the argument. So then I went to my mentor, Scott Klusendorf, the, yeah. the pro-life speaker who, who really inspired me to do pro-life work full time. And he helped me think through uh, the the argument well, and the, the response. Was this the first time he had heard it or no? No, no, no so no, no. He so he, he had dealt with it before. And and so, so then the, the response is to say, well, several things. First of all, uh, that there is a difference between um, the pregnancy in that when a woman uh, is pregnant, she, in the vast majority of cases, has consented to the act of sex 
which brought about the pregnancy. So in the case of the violinist, you were kidnapped and plugged into this person without your consent. But for the vast majority of circumstances where women are pregnant, they have consented to the act of sex. And since pregnancy is a possible consequence, they have to accept that. Kind of like if you play baseball with your child in the street and your son hits the ball and it goes through your neighbor's window, you can't say to your neighbor, you know, I consented to playing baseball but I didn't consent to the ball going through your window, so I'm not going to pay for your window to be fixed. Mm. Um, if your neighbor took you to small claims court, he would be able to argue that by virtue of playing baseball in an area where there was glass, there was, there was an inherent risk associated with that of breaking someone's window, and by entering into the game, you have to embrace the consequence and therefore pay to fix the window. Now, the abortion supporter who's hearing all of this will instantly say, okay, fair enough. That could um, cause us to say, well, the vast majority of abortions wouldn't be allowed because the woman consented to the sex. She has to accept the pregnancy, but what if she hasn't consented? Okay, but would they jump there so quickly? Would they not try and hold that ground longer than that? Would, you know? Not in my experience, but okay. if you want to try to no, hold that I, ground, let's sure go if, there. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if I would. I suppose in our in our modern mind, we have really separated sex and the ends of sex. Right. So sex is no longer something that I do for the good of me and my beloved necessarily, or if it is that, it's something totally distinct from having a child, isn't it? Well, this is true. There is that divorce of uh, pregnancy from sex so yeah. that people will say, that, that isn't doesn't what I matter. was consenting. To, yeah, yeah, really. yeah. I wasn't, even if it's in tied into the biology of it. I don't want that. So, in fact, they might even argue I used birth control, so I was actively trying to avoid that yes. consequence. Therefore, I'm not responsible. Um, but, but I can see how your baseball analogy would, would re, you know, refute that too. I mean, yeah, or driving fast on the highway. Right. The, all, all these sorts of things have these inerrant risks, regardless of the precautions I take as I drive or right. as I play with my or son. Even if if you think about what we do when it comes to, um, uh, uh, what's the word? I'm losing it. Uh, not thinking of it, but when when um, you have to pay child support, right? So yeah. imagine you have a couple have sex, uh, they break up, woman finds out she's pregnant, mm -hmm. goes. Doesn't this is tell not him. something the husband was right. intending. Not even the husband, right? They're not married. Right. So let's but say he, he yeah. doesn't want the child. And let's say that she doesn't tell him that she's pregnant because they broke up. But she decides that she wants to carry through with the pregnancy. When the baby's born, she mm. realizes, mm. hey, I need some financial help. Yeah. So she goes, they do a paternity test. He finds out he is indeed the biological father. And she says, you owe me child support. Now imagine if he came back and said, hey, I consented to the sex, but I sure didn't consent to this pregnancy. Mm. I'm not paying for child support. Yeah, most well, women would want to slap him. Yeah. Yes, as they right. want to. And when, if she takes him to court over this matter, the court will rule in her favor that by virtue of engaging in the act of sex and creating this human being, that he has to accept the consequences, which is the existence of a human being who's vulnerable and needy and requires financial provision, and therefore he has a duty to pay child support. Mm. So if we expect that of the men, yep. shouldn't we expect that of the women. Yeah. So that's kind of one angle we could come from. Another angle that we could come from is to say, parents have a responsibility to their offspring that we don't have to strangers. So ah, the nature of a, yeah. me in bed, for example, with a violinist is I don't know this person. Yes. And so it's nice of me to use my body to help right. them. You could choose to do that. Correct. That might be nice, but you're not obligated. Correct. There's no obligation. There's no moral duty to do that. And that is the difference we could say when it comes to pregnancies. It's a parent-child relationship, which is then where we can deal with those exceptions where someone hasn't consented in the case of sexual assault and nonetheless gets pregnant while they haven't consented to the act that brought about the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. By virtue of being the parent of the child, biologically, the rape victim is the mother of the offspring. Okay. Parents have a responsibility to uh, care for their offspring in a way they don't have a responsibility for strangers. So if a child is starving in your city, it's nice of you to um, go to a homeless shelter and, and, and work to provide food. Yes. But if you don't volunteer at a homeless shelter to help starving children um, or adults, uh, you're, you're not going to be found um, guilty of breaking a law by refusing to serve the homeless. Right. But if your child in your home is starving yes. and you're refusing yes. to feed your child, you will be found uh, legally and morally responsible for okay. neglect. Okay. 
So... Now, is this... Because we've dealt with the... Um, you've consented to this in some sense. Now yes. it seems like we're moving over to the, the pro-abortionist person responds to you, the pro-choice, right. however they want yes. to define themselves, responds to you and says, okay, I get it. In the vast majority of cases, there's consent, but you know, this woman was abducted. Uh, this wasn't right. her choice. So it's like we've, we've already moved into yes, this. Yes, we've now. moved into yeah. this to say, but parents have a responsibility to their offspring. We don't have to strangers. Which sounds mean, doesn't it? A little bit, not not generally yeah, speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that we have. <laughs> it's really cruel of you You're to expect so me mean. to feed my children. Right, right. No, but to say that, okay, you've been raped, so it's your responsibility. It, it, you, do you feel that? E even though, like, I get it logically that one has a responsibility, but it's like, I didn't ask for this. I was right. brutally assaulted, right. and now you are telling me that I am obligated. Like, who the hell are you to say that? Well, I think it's to say that we have a duty to help the vulnerable. What makes rape wrong? It's that you have a vulnerable party who is attacked by a stronger party. What makes abortion wrong? You have thing. a vulnerable party that is attacked by a stronger party that is in no way intended to minimize the gravity or the trauma of a sexual assault. It's to simply make the point that when injustice happens, when terrible things happen, it doesn't give the victims license to do just anything in response. I would argue that a, a victim of sexual assault who becomes pregnant um, doesn't have to raise the child. The question is, in a certain window of time where no one else can care for the child, is there a responsibility to meet the basic needs of the child? Yeah. So again, by way of analogy, we could imagine, you know, let's say that um, uh, you're kidnapped and uh, you're kidnapped alongside a newborn baby who's been kidnapped. Mm -hmm. And you find yourself, you've been, you know, you were knocked out and then you wake up in uh, a, a cabin, which is locked. There's no way of getting out. It's like boarded up. Um, you're in the middle of nowhere and you discover that you're kidnapped with a, with a child who's of no relation to you. Mm. And in this cabin, interestingly, there is formula, there's water, mm -hmm. and there are bottles. There yeah. is a capacity. No, There's no great kind of heroic virtue that's required right. for me to support this child. It's right, right there. it's right there. Yeah. And uh, do, are you related to this child? No, uh, but this is the basic needs yeah, yeah. of the child. So do you have a duty, even though you've been a victim of kidnapping, to meet the basic needs of the child in your presence who's incapable of meeting those needs right. for herself? Yes, and when you're yes. freed, yeah. hopefully, from this situation, you don't have to go on and raise the child. Yes. Now, so the abortion supporter might then say, well, then if you have to help the child in the cabin in the woods yeah. where you're both kidnapped, shouldn't you have to help the violinist because you're not related to the child and you're not related to the violinist? And so then it comes down to our basic or ordinary needs versus uh, extraordinary needs in the case of the violinist needing to be plugged into my body. So to, to unpack that a little more, I once debated a philosophy professor where I found myself temporarily stumped, huh. where he brought up the violinist argument, but he put a variation on it. I was about to do something similar, okay. so I wonder if it's the same thing. Go. So he made a variation of the argument, and I remember thinking, I'm not fully prepared because I know it yeah, in this yeah, form. Yeah. And so he started the debate by saying to the audience, I'm going to agree for the sake of discussion that the yep. embryo is a human person with the same right to life as all of us, but abortion is justified in the following manner. He mm -hmm. said, imagine this analogy. He said, imagine that you are a parent yep. and you have a born child and you love your child and your child suddenly gets very sick because your child has kidney disease yep. and is going to die unless your child gets a kidney transplant. Now he said, imagine that you are the only person in the world with the right body type so as to be able to donate one of your kidneys. In doing so, save your child's life. No one else has the capacity to be able to do this. He said, would it be nice of you, the parent, to give your kidney, one of your kidneys, to your child? Yes, it would be nice. Would it save your child's life? Yes, he said it would. Would it kill you? No, you've got two. But then he said, should the law force mm. A the parent to, to give, give their kidney to their a child. Great question. Yeah, and he said no. And even from a Catholic perspective, we know when it comes to organ donation that there isn't a moral obligation to donate one's organs. It, it can be an act of generosity in yes. the right circumstances, but no moral duty. And so he said, just as a parent should not have a legal duty to give their born child their kidney, a parent, in the case of the mother, should not have a legal duty to give her preborn child her uterus. <laughs> So I'm sitting there, Matt, in front of 200 students, wow. 
dying inside, totally panicked. And, you know, having an acting background, I thought, I'm going to look calm, cool, and collected. So <laughs> right. I'm fake note writing. Like, I like I had this crap, impassioned crap, response. Crap, crap, yeah, crap. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> and being a person of faith, I immediately started praying, like, come Holy Spirit, like, yes. Lord Jesus, like, what do I say? And I actually, I think I've only experienced this once in my life, tangibly sensed God speak to me very clearly, not audibly, but in a sentence that I can repeat exactly as he said it. He called me by name. He said, Stephanie. This is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay. Stephanie, I made the uterus for a different purpose. Now that's all God gave me. I was like, okay, give me more, 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 give more, more, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) yeah. So I was like, come Holy Spirit, you know, and, and, and then literally as my opponent was wrapping up his opening remarks where I then had to get up with a response, it was the moment of epiphany. The scales fell from my eyes. I had like this light bulb go off and I thought, I've got it. So I got up in front of everyone and I said, Professor Snedden makes a very compelling remark, very strong argument until I said, we ask ourselves a question. And the question we have to ask ourselves is this, what is the nature and purpose of the kidney versus the nature and purpose of the uterus? Because when we ask and answer that question, we come to see why a parent should not be legally obligated to give one, but actually should be legally obligated to give the other. And so Hmm. I said, the kidney exists in my body for my body. I said, the uterus is very different. Well, praise Jesus. (laughs) I said, the uterus exists in my body every single month, Mm. getting ready for someone else's body. Mm. Every single month, my uterine lining is thickening in great expectation Mm. for the implantation of the next generation. And I said, therefore, you could say the uterus is unique from all the other body parts in that it exists more for my offspring then for me, and they can therefore claim a right to that in a way the pre-born or born couldn't claim a right to, I get your kidney, I get this, I get that. So um, the good news is it was reported back to me. The professor told his class a couple days later that he was up all night trying to think of a response. I know, praise Jesus. Beautiful. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So all that to say that variation really helped me boil it down to a couple things. It's the parent-child relationship. This is back to the violinist. Okay. Yeah, violinist, yeah, 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 yeah. On, and then his and then the variation. The... Um, and even once someone said to me, you know, it's nice of me to donate my blood, but I have no legal duty to donate my blood. Right. That's true, but my blood's in my body for my body. The uterus is in my body for my offspring's body. So therefore, not only is this there a parental responsibility, you're the parent, this is your child, Uh, There is a parental responsibility to meet the basic needs of one's offspring. And so it's nice for a child to be taken to Disneyland, but there's no um, duty. Thank goodness, because I hate (laughs) Disneyland. I hate going to those theme parks. That's an extraordinary thing. It's not an ordinary thing. But food, clothing, shelter, that's ordinary care. And so in the case of pregnancy, Maintaining a pregnancy, allowing the uterus to be used for the very nature the uterus exists for, is the food, clothing, and shelter, so to speak, for the preborn child that's needed at that stage of one's offspring lo- offspring's life in the way a born child who is an offspring okay. needs that. Um, and then, so, so I would argue that because the parent-child relationship, because the nature of the uterus, because it's basic care, you have to care for the child. When it comes to the violinist, that's above and beyond the call of duty, so here's a question. it's extraordinary. Versus the child in the cabin, that's feeding a child who's not related to you is ordinary care. Yeah. And then the added element is, if you're the parent, even more. So here's a twist on the violinist argument that twist just, just came up. to me. So let's yeah, twist yeah, this yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, suppose the violinist turns out to be the son you gave away at birth, and you're now hooked up to your 30-year-old son oh, that you haven't met oh. in 28 years. Whoa, Matt, good question. Yeah, am I now morally obligated to spend nine months hooked up to this stranger? So I would say you're not, even if you find out that you are the parent of the child because... Being plugged into a born person is not the basic care humans need to grow through the stages of human development. That that's extraordinary. But wouldn't you agree that someone would look upon the woman who disconnects herself from the violinist who turns out to be their son 
with, with, with a lot more judgment, kind of horror. How could you do that to your son? Maybe legally you weren't obligated, but it's your son. Well, and a, I think I all think that you, would do would strengthen the pro-life argument, though. I I think you you could say There's that a greater people would be horrified. There, surely there is, but at the same time, there isn't a duty for you to give one of your kidneys to um, Liam one of or, your yeah. yeah Liam or Avila or who, whoever, because you might have to be factoring in other things. You might have to be factoring in that if you give one of your kidneys up, um, will that put your health in jeopardy and your ability to care for your family. Okay. So when it comes to extraordinary or heroic acts, we may choose them, but there isn't a moral or legal duty to choose these things. Okay. And so even though that's your, in this hypothetical, that's your born child, um, in that case, the giving of your kidney or being plugged into your kidney, of course, this is a made up scenario because that yep. doesn't even <laughs> exist. But the point is, there isn't the same duty as the basic care required for regular human growth and development. And so- If I wake up one day to find myself attached to my baby, you would say I have that obligation, right? Like let's, let's change that I would that say that you have an obligation to provide the basic care so if for I'm, your yeah, child. Right. And again, that's not basic. So, so it, it, I could choose to remove I, myself and have the child die and that not be immoral. If the child died, the question would be, what did the child die from? Did you kill them Because directly? is it within the nature of our species to need to be plugged into something, some, yeah. someone? Yep. It is for the first nine months of pregnancy. It actually after. is within our nature. Yeah, and yeah. so there's nowhere else for the child to be. That's the basic care required of a right, child. Right. And you could argue that even after birth, there's a little bit of that when it comes to breastfeeding. Yeah. So there is some degree, degree okay. of attachment. But then it comes down to, is this basic care required for the natural, normal human growth and development within our species versus something extraordinary stopping you from dying from kidney disease or something else? In that case, in the case of the preborn child, the child is just living. In the case of the scenario of the child who's got kidney disease or whatever the case may be, the child is dying from some pathology gotcha. which has presented itself. And the question is, how far do we have to go in response to the pathology? But we're not talking about that with pregnancy. Pregnancy isn't pathology. The child's need for food, clothing, and shelter is what actually any species really needs for mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. growth and development. Yo, thanks for watching. You can watch the entire episode on YouTube if you want. You can listen to it at The Matt Frad Show by subscribing on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And feel free to support me, patreon.com slash mattfrad.